was during his term that we began uh, the journey of India at 75 today, which we are all celebrating. So, 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 so that's his CII connect, which I really wanted to bring in uh, 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 and uh, really welcome him and thank him. Uh, we all know about the, his huge, huge achievements and uh, the lots, lots that he has done for Indian industry, for society, for India. And we have uh, another great person in Rajiv, Rajiv Mimani, who would lead the discussions and have, be in conversation with him for the next uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. So with that, once again, a very warm welcome and thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Over to you, Rajiv. Thanks a lot, uh, CV. Uh, thank you so much. Excellent introduction to Sunil. Let me add my welcome, Sunil. Always great to have a conversation with you, to interact with you. There's always so much to learn. So I'll, I'll jump into uh, what's a very interesting topic of being future ready, which uh, at least uh, uh, Sunil, from my perspective, is really to de how we deal with the challenges and opportunities they, that lie ahead of us uh, as organizations, as individuals, as society. And the, uh, the thing which is really interesting as you look at this is that, you know, even pre-COVID, this entire technology changes, ESG changes were becoming very imminent. And then COVID came, almost everything came to a standstill. But technology went on steroids, uh, the entire digital transformation, technology transformation. And as we went out of that, you had, you know, monetary policy which was at its extreme uh, you had uh, supply chains that were disrupted and we had, you know, early signs of inflation. And then you had the Ukraine, uh, Russia war and, you know, inflation, stagflation, supply chain disruptions of a different uh, order. And the reason I say this is because being future ready, I guess, is always important. But before I set the stage for you, I think it's probably even more important today. Uh, than it's been ever before, because we're just living in times of massive change. So, so with that, Sunil, I'll just hand it over to you, maybe some introductory remarks on how you see being future ready and, and, what, and how do organizations uh, prepare themselves to be future ready. Thank you, Rajiv, and I'm delighted to join the session uh, with you. But importantly, uh, thank you, CP, for your introduction. For me, my, you know, Time with CII and very intimate one year in 2007-8 is fondly cherished and remembered. And I did uh, sort of, I mean, I, when I take a responsibility, I take it uh, with all sincerity. And it was quite a, uh, you know, transformative year uh, for India, for CII. And uh, thanks for sort of reliving those moments of India at 60. We did in New York a massive campaign uh, and many other, you know, issues. And in fact, uh, CII probably doesn't get enough credit, but the uh, Indo-U.S. Civil, civil nuclear deal, I think CI played a great role. I mean, I personally traveled three or four times uh, to the U.S. at very short notices. And uh, what CI did for India's uh, you know, effort on the nuclear deal is absolutely transformational. And I'm, I know that the government has recognized it at uh, several quarters. So um, with that, let me uh, turn to Rajiv for you know what he mentioned about being future ready, which is also the theme of uh, CI's annual session this year. You know, we as uh, entrepreneurs are fairly well trained uh, uh, to, you know, look at uh, things that come out of the blue. You know, we have had several shocks, uh, you know, developing our businesses. Most entrepreneurs are well trained and have a strong, uh, you know, muscle build up to deal with situations. But last, uh, I would say two or three years, have been unbelievably relentless in uh, you know changes that have been thrown at the industry, at nation states, at individuals, and uh, we could have never planned for this. Um, when the COVID hit us, at least it appeared it'll go away in a few weeks and a few months, and then it took nearly two years, and still continues to disrupt many parts of the world from time to time. China, for example, today is in the throes of uh, the COVID lockdown of. Uh, levels that have never been experienced anywhere in the world. I mean, a complete shutdown of Shanghai and many other supply chain centers uh, would have sent uh, massive uh, shocks in the supply chain around the globe. So we still keep on living that. Then uh, uh, the Ukraine-Russia war uh, was uh, just bolted out of the blue. One could have never planned. I personally suffered on account of that in our new satellite project. Uh, so I would say the organizations of future 
or the organizations that have uh, sustainable characteristics in themselves are the ones which are almost always ready to deal with the uh, challenges so what are the some salient features that are required for sudden uh, you know attacks on the ecosystem as opposed to you know technology shifting trends or you know slow moving uh, issues that come up inflation is rising we all know it's coming it's coming things are going to happen so you start to prepare yourself we know china situation started to harden for india supply chain in the last several years many people started to you know look at uh, moving the supply chains out of china haven't been able to get anywhere close to where we should be but they started to plan it but in situations like a covid um, uh, or a pandemic or a war is where i think the resilience of any organization gets tested and uh, i must say uh, india in in a large measure has uh, done exceedingly well because most of the companies are agile uh, have been able to move uh, their uh, supply chains have been able to step up their uh, you know production when required companies like ourselves who are in the digital world could move massive amounts of traffic almost overnight from commercial centers to residential centers uh sometimes at the cost of uh, you know human lives people running on the streets fixing cables fixing towers moving uh, all the traffic that is required to be done from urban to rural from uh, commerce commercial centers to homes so you have done remarkably well i would say uh, in every segment of our industry uh, that's why india today is looking like a place where uh, business is still thriving uh, you know results are coming through which are uh stellar results uh, you know year after year quarter after quarter during this period of time yet there will be casualties um, rajiv you are very close to many of the uh, organizations you would see this from close the quarter we are seeing kind of a disconnect between uh, two levels of um, uh, uh, you know entrepreneurship or performance largely on the back of scale and size those who have large scale size have the money to put uh, technology at work have been able to uh, deal with this uh, uh, issue very very well i would say especially in india and many other parts of the world companies which are uh, in medium to lower end of uh, uh, businesses uh, in terms of size and scale have definitely suffered and people who are at the bottom end have suffered to in the business area the most uh, the western world of course could come up with amounts of monies to be given as a offset of salaries up to a particular level many other allowances uh, rates and taxes were waived off in europe the us was giving tremendous amount of support countries like india which have large population and doesn't have the balance sheet to support doles and subsidies directly in the hands of um, our uh, population beyond a point did have issues where the lower end of the society has suffered and that's where i would say the cii and many other organizations need to come hand in hand with the government to see how do we support our small medium micro enterprises uh to also uh, deal with the sudden shifts and changes that are there but if you ask me by and large rajiv the uh, scorecard for india is absolutely fantastic uh, and it will stay the course inflation is uh, high interest rates will harden we all know that but i think if there's any country that is well poised in position to deal with these uh, tectonic shifts it is in india yeah. last thing i would add to this is to set the stage i think uh, opportunity as a uh, ram emmanuel once said uh, once said you never let a crisis go to waste i think india is uh, i would say because of its strong leadership embracing that uh, thought extremely well china uh, supply chain issues china hostility in general ukraine russia war india being dependent on russia russian technology in the uh, you know our uh, weaponry uh, our weapon systems all are now offering opportunities for us to build our own uh, semiconductor uh, businesses manufacturing of defense products and india in the next 10 to 12 years will see a dramatic upliftment in all these areas where it was left behind and to my um, uh, belief i thought we will never be able to catch up uh, india missed the bus on electronic uh, both passive and uh, active components especially semiconductor race and of course we did not build a defense um, uh, productions to a level where we could support ourselves in the world that is changing and that is changing very very fast and i think india to my mind the next 10 10 years will have tremendous opportunities so when we look back hopefully we will still be active uh, uh, you know and our businesses that this could have been a very important inflection point for india 
when things looked bad, but India took advantage of these changes and stepped up the game and doubled down in the area of uh, Atam Nirbhar Bharat, Digital India, uh, etc. You know. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, Sunil. I think these are great, great points, and I completely share the optimism uh, in a in a pretty volatile environment around. Uh, you know, there is reason to be optimistic uh, in India with where things are. Just changing track a little bit, uh, you talked about size and scale, you talked about technology being important. I just want to say, you know, from your standpoint, uh, when you look at purpose, people, culture, organization structure, speed of decision making, in, in Bharati or in the organizations that you're closely involved with, you know, to deal with the changes, has some of that changed in the world that we are living in, whether it's the great resignation, whether it's the speed at which one has to act? So just wanted to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I think then, uh, this is again a very, very good, important point. And uh, many of the companies get it right. And uh, unfortunately, many don't. Uh, and I would say it's always horses for the courses. One culture does not fit all. My culture of my organizations across, I mean, wherever I have the chance to be, our, our businesses have a very uh, different culture than many others. And uh, many a times as a student of, uh, you know, business uh, structures, organization structures, I have um, deeply studied, both somehow bring absolutely stunning results. Mm. Uh, so you see companies which have command and control. Mm. I, I wouldn't name any, many of us know how it works. Uh, very strongly family-oriented um, uh, businesses where their patriarchs um, run their companies with very heavy hand and they believe that they are the owners and they must uh, you know, command the ship and everybody must listen to them. Outstanding successes. Equally, there are distributed uh, leadership models like our own company and uh, many others. MNCs are a classic example. They churn out great successes. So if you really look at it um, uh, uh, from the point of view, you must have a culture that works and then nourish it. When you mix and match cultures, when you try to strap on a culture from outside, that doesn't work. I mean, I can tell you about Airtel, if you get somebody from a command and control uh, background, they come and just don't make it. They never make it. Equally, I have seen many of my very, very high caliber people going from my company to command and control. And within weeks, uh, my SMS uh, inbox starts to get filled up, made a mistake, want to come back. Some have been brought back, some we couldn't uh, accommodate. But the fact is, it is inevitable that no amount of money uh, you know, can uh, you know, mitigate the cultural um, uh, mismatch that sometimes companies get into. Take the classic case of Vodafone idea. Uh, largest network in the country, largest fiber network in the country, largest market share at 42% when they were merging. And uh, Vodafone is a storied uh, telecom company. Everybody knows about it. They know the business. Birla is a very powerful, large business Indian enterprise rooted in India. So it should have been a fabulous combination of two very large companies coming together and continuing to stay the course and be number one. I said one thing uh, on that. I said this will not work. I should not say that it should fail. It will not work because you have two very, very different cultures being put together. That is not going to work. And that's precisely what happened in that company when you put together a very MNC open culture with a very different Indian honed into my, you know, very strong financial result orientation uh, coming together. It just did not work. And uh, the fact is, idea on its own used to perform significantly better in terms of its profitability, um, allocation of capital, return on capital sometimes even amazed us that they were doing better than us. So they were really very well focused. Now, on the other hand, Vodafone had a very open uh, culture like an MNC. And when it came together, it just did not work. So culture is very important, but what type of culture you don't prescribe. You just have one culture which works for you and irrigate and nourish that. In our case, uh, in my company, right from day one, I was very deeply inspired by large MNCs who are my partners. Uh, the fortune you know, of working with very, very large companies, AT&T, Siemens, um, a lot of Korean companies, Japanese companies in my very young days. And I learned from the grandmasters of, um, you know, uh, organizational structures, which were high governance, open structures. It fascinated me. It inspired me. And that's what I did, you know, in our, in our system. And uh, 
uh, meritocracy is important politics is avoided there is no command and control anybody can come and walk into my room shake my collar say i don't agree with you let's have a debate and the logic wins not the hierarchy or the authority and that's what uh, thrives in organization so what my message would be whatever culture you have strengthen that irrigate that and that if it works for you just stay with the course no oh, that's great sunil and on people uh, is is likewise uh, are you is bharti having a different in the last 4 5 years strategy on people kind of people that you want to hire uh, technology you know uh, the entire learning and development agenda around technology is that also changing or oh, it is changing it's, it's a hard task uh, we are old school um, you know um, you know we have this uh, active debates uh, how do you bring in young digital uh, savvy uh, you know workforce into the company which is very large uh, multi billion dollar company uh, how do you make them thrive how can they be different from the rest of the large monolithic uh, organization that one develops when you are large and big and that's a challenge that not only my company but every company in the world has faced some have done well they are good examples and i think we are now uh, well on our way uh, to uh, be a company which is just not a old style telecom company but a very powerful digital uh, company which serves the needs beyond just connectivity i mean 40% of india's traffic now moves on airtel all of india's digital traffic i'm accounting 40% moves on airtel pipes and networks that's one business but then we are also now doing stuff that was never tried by telecom companies before airtel payments bank is becoming a huge success we have a communication platform as a service cpass which is coming out with um uh, uh, products like iq where we are serving the enterprise customers we have cloud and security systems in place we are now adding surveillance to it and uh, from dozen few dozen digital uh, people working for airtel we have today just under 3000 people in the digital group working under a very able leader so that transformation is happening we are protecting them and what happens is when you get a, a good cohort of a, a particular type of uh, talent they start to attract more so initially it's always difficult now it's become a place that if you want to choose a digital career airtel is a great place to be it's just not narrative but it's a big amount of work that is going on in the digital area as well getting people is getting harder uh, is becoming uh, more difficult the talent out there has choices uh, especially in the new age startups which are offering um, magical amounts of stocks and salaries Uh, that becomes attractive uh, people are just working from wherever they are complete remote uh, working so that's attractive to the gen next so those challenges are there therefore you have to make yourself really relevant and really attractive to get talent hard task but thankfully i think airtel is and remains a very attractive place to work because it allows carriers to develop it allows uh, for uh, you know agitating your uh, ideas uh, in a very friendly environment where you can grow and uh, demonstrate your skill sets yeah. yeah so and sunil having observed the changes uh, in airtel i think that's very very visible uh, if i go back and i think if, i just request you to maybe reflect a little bit on the past 4 5 years of it you know we had massive regulatory changes regulatory fines uh, that came through uh, you had a new player come in geo that pretty much changed i would say significantly the landscape uh, the competitors the number of players uh, the approach to market and everything else uh, and and if you reflect back on that journey if i look at airtel and it went through uh, uh, its own set of challenges but if i look at the uh, revenue market share or overall market share uh, if you view market cap uh, Uh, as a barometer of success i think it's done very well in the last three years i know you still probably are not happy with where it is but uh, yeah, you know i think that's gone down very well so that's so if you reflect on that journey and as you went through that i think if you had you know what were your learnings and insights uh, because as compared to a lot of the other telecom companies i think you went through the gruel you took some hard decisions and at least as i can see it you know you've come out much stronger uh, of that uh, as compared to where you where you went into these these issues and the second piece is a little bit around uh, the future uh, and uh, you know you briefly mentioned about it but obviously around the world you're seeing different telecom companies obviously pivoting to 
digital rather than being drum pipes, you know, talking a lot more about the customer connectivity because the number of people you connect with or the telcos connect with is huge. But you still see different strategies in the way you create your own platforms or you, you know, partner with an ecosystem uh, of platforms and also with some of the changes that are coming around financial services, payment banks and others. So it'll be good to get your perspective on what you saw uh, and what you experienced uh, uh, individually as an organization. And also going forward, how do you see as you get future ready for, uh, you know, you have taken one path, someone else has taken some other path, other people have taken different paths. What's your perspective on that? Well, I, mean, I think um, Bharti in, in general and Airtel in particular has been, a, uh, to my mind, a classic uh, case study of how uh, companies deal with the tectonic shifts uh, in the marketplace, be that uh, technology shifts, competitive en environment, regulatory hits. I mean, I can't uh, believe that there's anything that has not been uh, dealt with by Airtel in terms of, um, uh, you know, dealing with adversities. And yes, I mean, it's a delightful story at the end. But there were moments uh, in the journey of Airtel when the question was not if, but it was when will they collapse. Mm -hmm. 2002 was, uh, 2002, 2003 was the first one. And uh, we had this famous Agra summit. Uh, we have the summit every year. And there was a band of 35, 40 people. It was not a large organization. We had our existential crisis. Stock was listed um, um, you know, about a month back, a few months back. At 45 rupees, it was brought down to its knees at 19 rupees. Cash was running out. Uh, revenues were not building fast enough. And we had taken a big bite of going all India in the, in the mobile side. So we had taken license for the whole country. Uh, we had taken license in about eight or nine places for fixed line. We were laying our submarine cable and putting also fiber, India's first private sector uh, fiber um, uh, initiatives in the country. So the ship was clearly creaking. Every rivet was moving and uh, it looked like uh, uh, things could go wrong. And that is where, you know, one is reminded uh, that if you have the right strategy in place, if you have uh, the right, uh, you know, technology in place, that will give you the right platform to win. But more important than that, that was, how do your people feel? Uh, once the people start to panic at the, at, the, at the leadership team level, then story gets over very, very fast, despite all the ingredients that you may have. You know. I think I recognize one thing that if we can keep our people motivated, if we can keep our, you know, uh, mind positive, uh, then we'll be able to get through. And that was, a, you know, to my mind, uh, living with it, and therefore I experienced it and became a, a big fan of how uh, an inspired uh, leadership team and an inspired workforce makes all the difference. And uh, I decided to travel the whole country. We were at that time operating in some places, but building in most of the places. And it was a day or day and a half in each of the states. Uh, India is divided into 22 circles, so call it all circles. I would spend the day reviewing uh, the progress, either on operations or on project um, uh, development. In the evening, sup with them, drink with them, dance with them, and off I go to the next place. Wherever, whichever place, whether it was Odisha or Bengal or Maharashtra and Pune and Bombay or Madhya Pradesh, I came out every time of a session at we will make this. We will make, we'll make it happen. I can see. I was worried about the external uh, factors. None of them were. And I said, if I can take the, become the lightning rod of the organization, take all that you know, uh, pain upon myself and keep the organization insulated, I think we'll be able to win this um, uh, uh, big war that was going on. And the fact is, from that time, the 19 rupees stock ran to 1,200 rupees in a matter of 18 months. And uh, that sort of give, gives you an idea of what happened in the company. Uh, circle after circle was launched, became better. Competition started to fall and trip on its own uh, program. Come 2008, 9, 12 new licenses were given. Uh, market went into mayhem. All the big players came in, both foreign and Indian, uh, from Docomo to, you know, Tarinars to everybody came in. And again, the market went through a, a huge cycle. We were better prepared. There's no question about it because the uh, competition was still big, uh, but not brutal. Uh, so we managed that. 2016 was big and brutal. Uh, you know, we got every hit. But this was a playbook of 2002-2003. I had uh, seen this uh, uh, in a whole crisis before I was in the midst of it. Thankfully, I'm still around to lead it. 
So uh, there was a very clear division between corporate office and Airtel office. You do your work, get onto the ground, do what you do best, serve the customer, build your networks, have the good quality of uh, you know network serving the customer. We will take care of the balance sheet. We'll take care of the regulatory hits. And mind you, those hits were pretty brutal. Six and a half billion dollars of fine uh, coming out of the Supreme Court. I mean, this is not US where you have a few billion dollars fine and you scoff it. This was a spine-breaking event for any company. Vodafone uh, collapsed. They got seven and a half billion. We got six and a half billion dollars hit. And uh, I still remember, I mean, you may have an insight to it. The auditors were uh, finding it difficult to put their pen to the paper to make it a going concern. And that was an overnight battle that Akhil and all our financial people had to do pitch battle with the auditors. Uh, thankfully, you are not the auditor <laughs> for that year. And uh, we managed to finally convince them that we'll be fine. But it was a very difficult event. And it came out of the blue. It was really, really. I wish we had lost this case in uh, 2005-06, just because we won the case, we never paid the money. And finally, when we lost it in Supreme Court, it came back to haunt us all the way back. So it was a backbreaking one. Spectrum auctions were other one where your own spectrum, which was assured to you, will be renewed after 20 years for every 10 years, suddenly was changed to say, no, no renewal. You have built a beautiful building, uh, which was uh, guaranteed to you for 20 plus 10 years at a time with a particular fees. Stand out in the queue and auction back for your building. It's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. I mean, you have bought a plot of land and then you have built a billion dollar building and uh, dressed it up well. You're thrown out and you're standing along with everybody else to bid for the same building and from ground zero. It's hard. So you had to pay a ton of money to get back into your building and we had to do that. So I think balance sheet had become stressed. And that was the time I said, you will have to dilute ourselves to help with it. This company needs to survive. How do I care whether I own 40% or 26%? Let's just go and raise capital. Easier said than done when a company is under crisis, when the company is going down, and you have a very, very, very powerful competitor, and regulatory hits are coming left, right, and center. Who is going to give you the money? Who is going to put money into the company? Today, pardon me for saying it, word of an idea. For the last two years, it's been saying we are raising money, we are raising money, nothing has come through. This is where governance, credibility, of an organization, of individuals, or promoters count. I made six calls. The first six calls got me about six or seven billion dollars. Uh, then I told my partners in Singapore, we need to do some rights issue. They said, go ahead. We did two rights issue, two and a half billion dollars, three and a half billion dollars. We made some strategic sales of towers in Africa. Uh, we made some tower stake sale in India. And we raised in the last 30, 34 months, 18 billion dollars uh, and repaired our balance sheet. Today, Airtel's balance sheet is healthy, it's strong, and uh, we are now down to two and a half players uh, for a country the size of India. So future looks good now. Now, will there be one more crisis uh, many years uh, going ahead? Who knows? But this company has become very, very strong and battle hard. And some of the salient features have been Focus on customer needs and customer satisfaction has been relentless. We have been very hard upon ourselves to, I'm the biggest critic of my own company. It, this is not working well. This service is not okay. Many of us are you know, doing their job day and night. When I come for a dinner, I, you will corner me or somebody else will corner me. My phone does not work in my third basement. Yes. Nowhere in the world it works, but it must work in India. And that's the expectation. And by the way, you only pay me $2 a month, not $50 a month like they pay in the U.S. So it's a hard task, but the company is well, um, I would say, structured and engineered to deal with this. That's great. And going forward, uh, Sunil, on the, uh, you know, we talked briefly on the, on the platform side, on telecom being sort of much broader connectivity. And again, you look at different players, some building their own ecosystem, some leveraging on third party ecosystem and everything else. How, what's your perspective on this? You know, again, I go back to it. Large organizations are terrible for innovation. So uh, who could have thought that telecom companies which have been running their businesses for long years uh, and, uh, you know, had the right to win in every aspect that we see today, which has gone away from us, uh, will blow it up. It's not Airtel, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Vodafone, you know, Telefonica, name any company. Nobody got it going. We were simply living on our SMSs, comes WhatsApp, just takes the entire revenue of SMS, which was it 
billions of dollars around the globe. God, finished. So we couldn't do it. Why could we not develop our messaging platform? It's actually a piece of cake if you look back today. Mm-hmm. But it's a denial mode. You don't want to listen to new ideas. People say, no, no, where this is going to go? And I see this classically happening in the satellite industry. Now, the geo players who have had two, three, four satellites up in the uh, space have been serving the globe, kept on saying, Leos have no future. We don't need to go to Leos. And the fact is, geos are in existential crisis today. Because the whole industry has changed. So, and you can keep on going, but Xerox and yeah, yeah. hundreds of other companies. So, I would say uh, to a very, very large degree, uh, mm. our uh, companies have woken up very late. Mm. Trillions of dollars of um, uh, valuations have transferred to the OTT players, whether it's the Facebook, whether it's the Google. So, these are the areas where it'll be very hard for you to go and compete now e commerce. And they all ride on us, by the way. We spend billions and they enjoy trillions of valuation. That's the equation here. <laughs> so we have decided that we just can't let everything go out. We need to be serving and doing value added. Don't sell just uh, wheat flour, but sell packaged bread now. So at least get to that level. You may not be able to do a gourmet dish in a restaurant, but at least get to a second level of um, you know, value addition. So CPAS, communication um, uh, platform as a service. We have a lot of properties which are idle. We are doing advertising there now. Our advertising revenue is growing very, very strongly. Cloud, we are creating cloud for SMEs. Big people may not come to us. They may go to Google Cloud, Microsoft, Amazon, but there are lots of small, medium enterprises who we serve, and they will take our cloud services. Uh, Cybersecurity is a massive uh, issue that is becoming uh, relevant for us. So that's an area we are providing services. And the last but not the least is our own data centers where we are housing a lot of uh, digital players. But am I doing everything myself? I am dealing with the uh, uh, customer-facing side myself. At the back, there are a lot of partnerships. I believe in solid partnerships because there are people out there who can do stuff significantly better than we can do. So we have um, Palo Alto Networks providing the cybersecurity. Nikesh Arora, one of our Indian friends, is a CEO there. We are providing their services. Um, uh, We have you know, many other uh, companies which are plugged into us. We have very close relationship with Netflix, with Amazon Prime, with Hook, with um, Hotstar. And these are all the wonderful entertainment, streaming, uh, and uh, downloaded services that we deliver. We have our own uh, music platforms. Wink is a very successful music platform. Um, uh, Airtel Thanks, which is a big property of Airtel, where you can go and uh, pay, uh, you know, bills, you can buy stuff, you can uh, subscribe to uh, various things is there. So we have started to get better. Can I, uh, you know, take this um, uh, whole equation up? The idea is, yes, our digital revenues should start to become meaningful in their own right in several billion dollars over the next few years. And thankfully, the valuations or the multiples that one generates in the digital business because the capex is low is significantly better than Telecom, which is a very solid business, but a capital guzzling business and a spectrum guzzling business every year will be a good combination to have in the group. Yeah. yeah. So Neil, just uh, uh, stepping a little bit away maybe from telecom, lots of businesses when we talk to, you know, depending on where you are, you're dealing with AI, blockchain, crypto, metaverse, uh, OTTs. I mean, you yourself will be looking at 5G. Uh, in different ways, different forms of uh, NFTs, uh, tech platforms that are coming. So what would be your advice to corporates as they're looking at, or entrepreneurs are budding, as you look at people who are dealing with so much of change around technology, which can fundamentally and radically shift business? Should they be yeah, it is, indeed is. or so that, that sorry, yes. You know, you have to make your own businesses uh, talk to the current day and future. So, I mean, just take one example. Take Nika. I mean, that's a good example to have. What are they doing is selling beauty products which have been sold for long years, you know, whether it was Imami as we were growing up or all the big ones, uh, ST Lauders and Lakmes and all that. It's been there. It's, it's not that this is something that suddenly uh, the humanity has discovered that you can brighten your face and you can look good. And, you know, so it's, it's always been there. So what they did was a very clever um, uh, technique to make people buy it at a good price point, deliver it well, and be able to choose it in the comfort of their homes and then more importantly, in privacy. Uh, when you go out and looking at the shops and the shelves and all that, if you're a young 
uh, girl and you're looking at some cosmetics and all that people around you are watching what you're picking up what you're not taking and the shopkeeper will try to sell you a particular thing here you are in charge you know you go through page by page turn where you want to go look at the product look at the recommendations on social media for that particular product and you start to buy it and the back end uh, they organize their supply chain beautifully well and as they got traction they said by the way we will create stores as well so that people can also go and touch and feel and experience our stores uh, similarly if you go overseas people like barbara strom who are in the similar businesses have tried to open up beauty clinics you can walk down the mount street here and get a facial and uh, you know she will be actually exposing you to a products and therefore you will end up buying the product so i would say this example can be strapped on to many many businesses where you need to become uh, you know relevant to the current um, uh, needs which is really younger future generation which does not uh, you know procure or shop like we used to do in our past you see things are dramatically altered uh, so any business that you have are you making it uh, relevant for current needs and that means really uh, the way people now approach uh, merchandise you need to be technology savvy you need to have uh, you know massive uh, tech uh, backup and platform you need to present yourself your ui and ux need to be very intuitive you go to a site if you struggle on it for more than 30 40 seconds you're going to abandon it it needs to grab you it needs to get you two clicks your job is done and you're out of the site uh, and move on to something else now this is where a lot of companies are struggling today and becoming uh, less relevant and those companies that will not embrace uh, the changes that are required will suffer as to the larger part metaverse i mean this is now when i talk to now facebook or google the whole focus is shifted this metaverse now and what's going to happen in metaverse is really up to your imagination i mean instead of our video uh, talks just now i could have been standing on a stage with a full hologram uh, presented as a human being there and uh, talking to everyone and the world will change you know and i'm just talking about one thing but go beyond it robotic surgery is drone management supplying uh, you know goods on people's rooftop through a drone uh, autonomous cars i mean the list is endless uh, the new uh, if some of you have experienced the new uh, virtual meeting rooms are you know 5d now i mean you can talk to i can talk to you just turning my head and you'll be sitting next to me i've already experienced that i've seen it it's unbelievably powerful mm-hmm. so world will change yeah Uh, so Neil, I'll, I'll just quickly shift to I know an area of interest to you, but this is more around geopolitics, and again from a future ready standpoint. So starting from I would say starting from the Trump era, COVID, uh, Ukraine war, this whole you know we all lived in a world of globalization, and that was the walking in theme in any business that you have to be super competitive. You focus on those things which you're really good on, and you know you have a global supply chain and you build that out. even if you look at india you briefly touched upon this atmanirbhar manufacturing in india creating more domestic value chains so as you look at future and as businesses are looking at getting future ready in your view should we be looking at a more deglobalized world should we be looking at a more globalized world and also the leading question is do you think the way businesses and politics engage that dialogue will change because of these dynamics that are changing you know i was one of the vocal critic of trump i got uh, slammed for that as well um, i was the chairman of um, icc international chamber of commerce which works very very closely with wto we were in, in and out of wto with b20 g20 um, oecd organizations and you know our view was the globalization must never be reversed hmm. and the trigger for that started with trump era yeah uh, if america started to say it's good to say you know make in america or uh, you know made in america that is fine but to say that i will shut out the world hmm. and uh, start to be punitive on imports and um, i'll discourage things calling corporations to say move your factories from mexico back to uh, you know the us that part started to clearly worry me and uh, i must say i was very vocal about it but how wrong i was that was not just the start that was going to become the norm uh in the years to come in the last four or five years i'm afraid and sorry to say that things have dramatically changed so what has happened here from a global or globalized world is now becoming uh more self reliant you know trying to do as much as you can within your own country and this was the norm in 70s and 80s 
you know restrictions were there import duties were high you couldn't move products there were so many restrictions come wto we had a global order in which we said you can make something very good here supply to the world and have scale and everybody can enjoy customer gets lower price better quality and that's how china developed and unfortunately we became concentrated in one country which was not a democracy imagine if china would have been a democracy i think this problem would have never occurred mm-hmm. now that is where i would say uh, if the world would have chosen india and i always say the eagle at that time always sort of hovered around india but landed in china hovered around india landed in vietnam i think that was the global misfortune and of course bad for india i had we got that opportunity when uh, kissinger was scouting around the world for global supply chains i think the world would have been in a better place but today to answer your point i think we are going to have broken uh, you know blocks uh we are going to have uh, i would say trusted supply chains as opposed to global supply chains and that's a big uh, massive shift that you're going to see no more global supply chains trusted supply chains and if that means more pain more cost we'll suffer it look at what's happening in europe uh germany is going to suffer 12% increase in its uh, energy costs but they're going to buy from the trusted sources and not go to the global source which is the cheapest which is already connected on the tap they're going to go away India is going to stop buying in a big way. We have stopped buying Chinese equipment for telecommunications, for example, and we have suffered the consequences of that of uh, price hikes, etc. The shortage of chips, which is affecting every industry, not just mine, whether it's automobile or uh, component or, or uh, consumer electronics, everybody is suffering. Prices are going up. Mobile smartphone prices are fifteen, twenty percent. Some cases thirty, thirty, forty percent because chips are coming from China. Suddenly, that has uh, gone into a huge problem. same will happen with defense equipment large parts of russian equipment we don't realize has components coming from a western world which is getting stopped you know so unfortunately i think globalization is over is it permanently over i don't know but when we see these trends they are there for decades they are not uh, there for years this is now gone for tens of years the good news is india is a continent of consumers we are not a small little country uh, which is not endowed with our own markets our own resources so we will be fine uh, and the second most important part is india also is a trusted source so we must get tremendous uh, tailwinds because of this uh, shift so in some sense in a selfish way as an indian and uh, somebody who's very proud of i uh, thought uh, raising the indian flag everywhere it's going to be very very good for us uh, india needs to play its cards well so far it's played it extremely well it's you know balanced its um, uh, you know geopolitics and uh, my own view is that uh, uh, supply chains will start to rest in places which are have democracies open societies and that's where most of the procurements will happen india will benefit on the ukraine russia war unfortunately my own assessment is slightly different uh, while i am a businessman i am an entrepreneur i have deep interest in politics i serve on many global think tanks which are heavily and rather only solely into geopolitics my assessment is we are in for a very long war this is not going to go away soon and the end result in my assessment is going to be a very weakened russian state yeah. mm-hmm. okay. Okay. and and sunil the uh, we are coming to the close so i just maybe i'll just ask the last uh, question this is on esg the sustainability agenda uh, you know if you remember maybe you know two years back when you went to davos suddenly from digital transformation esg had become the big thing and you know i look at esg in two aspects one is obviously you know esg as a business and if you look at even india and if you look at some of the largest groups reliance adanians anyone tata so the amount of capital that they are allocating to some of those businesses which were around environmental whether it's solar hydrogen and others is massive so that is one aspect of this and and the question is again as organizations look at being future ready should what in your view what's the life cycle you know how rapid do you think the change will be and second it's for any other organization you know it has the russia ukraine war died back a little bit on bit on esg or you think this process is going to start because again people are talking about you know we energy we not you know we need to do more on that and suddenly you hear less the voice levels on esg seem to at least to the outside seem to have come down a bit so wanted to get your perspective at least as organizations look ahead 
So let's uh, split the ESG in three parts. Hmm. I think S and G is settled. Yes, uh, the social part and the governance part, there is, there is no going back. It was always becoming important and uh, companies which are uh, big and strong and listed especially in uh, very uh, you know, open environments and high quality environments like US, UK and hmm. India, I would say. The governance part has become very strong. I mean, SEBI's own regulations have been absolutely outstanding to ensure that the companies are, in, in some sense, we also complain that they are going overboard, but they have taken care of the G part, the governance. And I tell you, we are an embodiment of that. We live that. We did things before they were mandated. On each front, we have done it before they were mandated. On social, I think that's, a, I would say, the social contract that you have with the society, with your employees, uh, and all the stakeholders, your vendors and supply chain. Again, something that uh, I can tell you, we embody that uh, in the best possible uh, way we can. Our industry in itself serves the communities in a way which um, you know, enables them to lower their first part, which is environment. I mean, they don't need to travel as much. They can do uh, you know, virtual stuff like we are doing just now. They can uh, digitize uh, and uh, carry bits and bytes on a network. So our business itself has a deep sustainable value for the society. So the S part, our employees are our partners, our employees are owners, our employees are extremely important for us. Our vendors and suppliers all live with a charter and a code of conduct that is best in class. So S and G, I would say all good uh, companies will be, will be in, a, in a good shape. The E part is uh, where the focus uh, is shifting very strongly. It was always climate change, climate agenda, carbon uh, emissions, uh, global warming, and that now is kind of captured into this ESG. You know, that's an area which has suffered a little bit because suddenly when you have Saudi not producing more oil because they don't want to be pushed into a corner to produce more oil because Russia is not um, uh, able to export to the Western world. So suddenly people are saying, all right, produce as much coal as you can. Fire up the thermal stations back in uh, play. And many, many countries are firing the thermal um, uh, you know, production back. So yes, to some extent, there is going to be a setback to the environment agenda. But do keep one thing in mind, the capital allocation, and when you spoke about some large business houses now focusing on that, is going to be absolutely unforgiving of those who are not going to be jumping on this bad bag. And you can be into the fossil fuel-based uh, uh, supply chain. You will suffer on the uh, outcomes on your multiples in the stock market. Your financing will become more expensive or becoming less available. So you need to get focused there. But there will be industries who will say, we'll make a ton of money on uh, doing this and we don't care about the others, so the equation is okay. Or there will be countries which have no choice but to step up their, you know, at least temporarily, their fossil fuel-based um, energy requirements because they have no choice. They still need power. They need energy to fire up their communities and uh, factories. So to that extent, I would say, again, it will be uh, exigency rather than a choice. From the choice point of view, you need to now become extremely uh, environment friendly. Uh, companies like us, we are the, uh, India's first telco uh, to sign for the UN Compact. Uh, we have signed the uh, SBTI, the Science Based Target Initiative Partnership. We are an active part of that. We have committed to 1.5 degrees of global warming limits. And uh, importantly, that we will be carbon neutral in the next uh, 10, 15 years. Thanks, Ron. Thanks a lot, Sunil. I can see CB's face popping in and out, and Nija also is getting restless. So I think we have yeah. exceeded our time limit, but it was great as always. Very informative and great to have this conversation. Thank, thank, thank you, so you Rajiv. Very much enjoyed being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vistal. Thank you, Rajiv. Excellent Thanks. session. Thanks.
जी जी मैं तो नहीं आ रही हाँ और डाइट तो हाई प्रोफाइल है ना तो हमारा कोई डायरेक्ट ऑप्शन है नहीं Hero Motor Corp, the motorcycle leader. of years nature has given us all we need but now nature is calling on us to be more mindful about energy and to stop before it's too late but who's listening we are we're answering the call by leading a transformation and giving it all we have our experience of 20 years our limitless passion our world class operating standards our partnerships and our investments to double our business in the next 4 years but energy alone won't be enough that's why we're turning energy into action action that ushers a new age of growth for india action that lights up a billion dreams action that uplifts our communities action that sparks a movement of sustainable change action that saves the planet who are we agni prithvi ambu vayu we are a prava energy a diversified energy business here to help india transition to clean energy we born and shaped by the elements so when the wind becomes stronger the sun shines brighter the fire flares and when you take a step to give back more than you take we're there with you this is energy for india this is energy in action
फ्रेंडली नहीं करते हैं तो विकास हमारे लिए भी संकट बन सकता है Avada is a leading builder of renewable energy projects in India. We have built complex solar and wind power projects aggregating to over 1.1 gigawatt capacities. This is only the beginning. We need scale to power the entire country using the solar. Our emphasis on systems and processes has enabled the organization for flawless execution by consistently decreasing its on-ground development cycle. thus completing projects several months before schedule with a strong epc execution capabilities and project portfolio we had managed to build a competitive advantage through already locked in land banks long term signed mous ppas with state utilities avada promise of a sustainable future